Hey everyone, welcome back to The Grit Files. I'm your host, Laurel and Mears, and we've got, well, like we always do every week, a great show for you. In the house today, we've got Dr. Deborah Jonas, and she is the director at the Center for Education, Research, and Innovation as part of SRI Education. And for those of you that don't know SRI, well, they're one of the preeminent research institutes on the planet, so we're really privileged to have Deborah join us here today. Hi, Deborah. Welcome to the show. Hi, Laurelyn. Thanks so much for having me. First, maybe let's start off with a little bit of context around what's going on in education right now. People are debating. We've seen the 20% drop off in enrollments at most colleges because of the COVID effect. Talk to us about what's going on. Well, there's a lot of trends going on in college um, that appeared during and after the COVID pandemic. And the main concern in the college space is both the drop off, as you mentioned, and also the ability for colleges to actually meet the needs of students and their future employers or their current employers. Um, call, even before the pandemic, colleges had moved to um, increasing their, their online space and the courses that they offered to students online. And many educators are concerned that that type of teaching and learning environment isn't working as well for students as in person. And so one of the big challenges is really how to maximize um, opportunities for teaching and learning for the people who are in colleges now. Um, and that group is really different than folks who were in school when I was in college, for example, which is quite some time ago, um, in that all our, our colleges are just serving a far more diverse group of people in terms of their age, their backgrounds, their prior educational and workplace experiences than ever. So there's lots of adjustments to make in really helping students meet their own goals. Often um, those goals are related to sort of their next steps in the job market. And then this is part of the whole debate that our educational institutions really chartered with the responsibility of making people workplace ready or aren't academic institutions chartered with the responsibility of providing foundations and fundamentals in education in theory, which then can then be applied in the workplace. And employers are saying, no, you're not teaching them all the soft skills or career readiness or things that they need to do to be functional workers in the workplace environment. I think um, there, we know that there are some really fabulous examples of colleges and universities that work closely with employers, sometimes even design programs with the institutions um, and create that very close alignment with between programs and employer needs. And in some ways it's good for students or prospective students to really step back and understand what is it as a student that you're interested in pursuing and how does this program help me meet my goals now and, and get me ready for the next step. So you might imagine if I enroll in a program that's going to take me two years, three years, am I going to be in a good place after three years to make a decision about what to do next? Am I going to be ready for that, for that next step in my career? Am I going to be ready for that next step in graduate school? And I, I think also um, most of my research has been uh, the transition from high school into college, which is sort of a different space than you just asked about. I think what's really important that we remember about um, that transition space is creating opportunities for students so that when they leave, they have a choice about what to do next. And as you pointed out, Laura Lynn, colleges do all sorts of types of preparation for students. They can help you get a certificate. Um, there's a college here where I live in Virginia that uh, has a 13 week program for power line workers. And you get a commercial driver's license and you're certified to work on power lines, which is quite a good paying job. Um, and you have to be 18 and you have to be eligible for the CDL and there's some other pieces of the puzzle, but that, that's a short-term program that can get you to, to your next place. And we have everything from those kinds of short-term credentials, one-year credentials, two-year credentials, four-year and beyond. And, and students should be able to make the choice of which of those they pursue, where sort of other educators, particularly in K-12, need to make sure that the program that students are receiving and the education they're receiving 
put them on the path to make those choices, that we don't put them on a track or a pathway that has roadblocks towards that choice. And when we have the conversations, like I'm also part of uh, Virtual Enterprise International, which focuses on high school seniors. And instead of a mock UN, it's like mock startup. Right. And so everyone is tasked with having their own startup. Someone's a CEO and they do all these perturbations throughout the air, like, oh, the CEO quit. Now what? Right? The founder quit. And having the conversations with all of these college students, it's incredible because they, at the beginning of the program in the school year, don't understand really the aspects of collaboration and nuance and things that are going to be required in order for them to move their personal agenda forward. And when you compare their learnings and their trajectory to those who haven't had access to a program like that, it's remarkably different. And so my question is like all of the work, you've got such a, a large research team looking at concepts, design, evaluating what's going on. Do you think that there should be an overhaul to the current curriculum, maybe all the way through K-12 or certainly in the latter couple of years of high school to better prepare them for this transition to college? So I think there are opportunities to update the curriculum and how we teach in ways that better prepare students um, for really what I view as sort of the next steps of their lives, right? College, high school graduation isn't in a college graduation too. They're not endpoints. They're really the next steps, the doors to the rest of your life. And so a lot of the things we're teaching in K-12, students need those skills to prepare for the rest of their lives. So we can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? We won't, mathematics in particular is super important for employers. Employers tell us, Students need math skills, the problem solving skills, the ability to structure the problems they face, which we currently learn often in mathematics classes. They need those skills to succeed in the current job market. And so we can't just get rid of all that. The question is how do we teach in ways that are relevant to students and help students understand, for example, let's say you're a student who really likes to move around, they don't sit still, likes to work with their hands a good work-based learning program, which many of our schools provide now, can help that student understand, well, does that mean that I should go into construction or plumbing or be a surgeon or a teacher working with young children where I'm sitting on the floor and moving all day? All of those things are feasible for this, you know, the hypothetical student who's not sitting still in class. And my question would be to the school is how, how do we make sure teachers help students see that and then provide them the learning program to explore as to explore the different opportunities that they might enjoy, as well as to learn the, the academic and non-academic skills that they need to be successful in that, in whatever they want to do and the choices that they want to make. And given the prominence of SRI now, like of course, SRI education, I would think that people within and across boards of education and higher levels of administration within the education sector, not even just higher ed, but K through 12 and at the government levels, local and state and even federal, that they're listening attentively to what you all are putting forward with respect to policy changes, potentially even curriculum changes. Are you getting the support and the ears that you feel that you need to really move things or you just have to generally accept that it's just a very slow process and you guys are on it and everybody's doing their best? So our team at SRI, we're really in this to make a difference for the people with that who we serve. And so we strive to work with clients who are really in it to support and create the opportunities to create those changes at every level of the system. And you were tapping into that. So a couple of things, Deborah. So number one, of course, change is brutally hard. And not only is it hard to affect change, many people on the receiving end of that change resist it right? For one reason or another. So you've got two sides and automatic like friction right there. The second point that I wanted to make is that nobody gets it right all the time, right? I mean, I, I don't know any people like that. I know a few who think they do, but I don't really know anybody who gets it right all the time, <laughs> individually or organizationally. And then the third point, just as you were wrapping up your statement, that's exactly where I wanted to go. It's, it's all about those fundamental skills of teaching people how to learn. And I think that that has been, I don't know, maybe 
a little bit overshadowed. So many people are focused on like, oh, did you get the STEM curriculum? And oh my goodness, well, they cut out all of the wonderful arts and creative programs and music and things like this in favor of one more stupid math class that I don't want my kid to take because my kid's not good at math and hates math. But what I think needs to be, where there needs to be more emphasis is that how students can be taught to learn and be more independent no emphasis. I mean, I, I'm kind of rambling on. What, like, I don't know. There's not really a question there. It's more of a statement. Like, are, are you seeing some of the same things or are people really dialed into the value of teaching people how to learn? I think both are most certainly out there. Um, we've got examples, for example, the entire career and technical education program in West Virginia is based on the exact concept that you just mentioned earlier with your innovators, where the CTE classroom is a business and the students have to run it as a business. And the whole idea is to actually help the programs evolve from rote learning and here's what you have to know, so go learn it and bring it back to a problem solving business like environment so that students have those experiential skills. There's, there's programs all over the country like that, some of which the schools create, some of which they create with employers and colleges. Um, so I definitely think we have a ways to go in terms of some of our some of our schools really helping students to learn to think and learn to learn. And a lot of that can be done within our current curriculum. So you don't necessarily have to have huge changes to learning standards. If you build the expectation, for example, that when you're learning various math constructs, students are problem solving and um, Oftentimes in math, it's actually not about getting the answer right, but knowing how to get to the answer. So teaching students how to structure that problem for learning and maybe see that there are lots of ways to solve those problems. It's actually very common in great math classes. And so a lot of the work that we've been doing over the past several years is helping educators change the structure of their classroom and their teaching to meet the current learning standards while providing those thinking opportunities, learning to learn opportunities and um, problem solving activities for students in ways that build the kind of lifelong learning skills that, that you were mentioning for just a minute ago. And, and at the same time, what the evidence supports in math is that rote learning and just being able to spit back the information is really, that's more arithmetic and mathematics is more about thinking and problem solving um, and takes a higher level of thinking than basic arithmetic and rote mathematical knowledge. And, and you need both. I mean, we do need to know how to multiply and add, subtract, and divide. So Deborah, I'm a chicky poo poo who loves math and science and all that good stuff. And I brand myself as a STEMinist. And <laughs> yeah, well, right. right. <laughs> I, I even have the t-shirt. I meant to wear it today, but it was so hot and it's got pink sparkles on the STEM part with all these microscopes and computers and really cool stuff. That said, some of the studies that have come out recently are showing the continued decline of interest in girls in pursuing STEM subjects, particularly mathematics and physics. Still quite a bit of interest in biology and some of the um, sciences there, so that's good to see. But what do we do differently to get people jazzed about science. People are getting chances to talk to astronauts now through teleschool and everything else. What more is there to be done? I mean, you're SRI, you have access to everything. You can talk to astronauts. I actually think lots of my colleagues do talk to astronauts. I just haven't recently. Um, so my research is not specifically on gender in STEM or gender in math. I think part of the solution, however, is really to engage young children. We know that having engaging instruction across all topics, math and science, at from, from the, an early age and at every age is important. We're all more interested in learning when, when it's an engaging, re relevant content or relevant topic you know, to our lives. And so really figuring out how to reach students and in the, in the learning, in the math and science learning is important. And some of that is helping teachers be more confident in their own skills. I think communities we, we often are engaging communities, our researchers at SRI finding ways to engage the broader community, whether it's the library, volunteers, um, reaching out to NASA and other science-based organizations to help our schools in this space. You know, teaching takes a village. 
Oh, I love that. And I love community learning. And as a nerd, I would have been one of the first people signing up for that. Me, me, me. And my parents would have been running behind me to, to come join. So that's fantastic. And I'd like to transition just into the last few minutes we have into some conversation in and around some of the personal experiences and things, because I do think that you've helped really underscore how things are getting better. People are listening. There are dedicated research programs and efforts like your own who are committed to making differences in how our students, our youth learn and how they will be prepared for success in their lives, regardless of which path they take. So that's really exciting. Now, in the last couple of minutes, some fun questions and some silly ones, right? Because, you know, we can have this conversation too. If I gave you an undo button and you get a hit at once, what do you undo? What do I undo? That's really hard. Um, I would actually, I know what I would. I would have learned a foreign language and be fully fluent in a foreign language. For I would have been that, you know, fluent for decades. Gotcha. Now, what about you? You've been on a tremendous journey from your graduate school efforts to uh, the large leadership program that you're working through and you manage a, quite a significant team of scientists and educators and all kinds of folks. How have you changed since you started this journey? Oh, in so many ways. <laughs> there usually are several, yes. <laughs> I would say I am far more comfortable speaking in a public space than I ever was when I started. Um, I have had people tell me from a very young age, I shouldn't do public speaking. And I, I spent some time thinking actively, I should prove them wrong. Um, and then I continue to learn it's not a space and here I am on a podcast. So clearly speaking publicly, um, it's not a space I'm super comfortable in. And I continue to work at getting better and better at public speaking and, um, well, there you go. And I appreciate you being here and being vulnerable and sharing that public speaking is one of the biggest fears that most people have. And in this digital world of you know, living, learning and everything that we're doing online, you pretty much need to be prepared to be able to speak and engage, you know, at whatever level. And so you're doing a great job. And I'm sure if our audience is here, you hear applause for Deborah, the background. Um, and I'm lucky, my grade four teacher who I adore, I mean, she died a really long time ago, but she was the one who said, you're not going to be shy. Come away from that wall. Speak, you know, <laughs> pushed me up against the wall, hit my stomach, raise your diaphragm, let the words come out. I was, oh my God. And you know what? Ever since then, bring it on. I'm loud. I'm on the stage. I'm good. So she, she changed my trajectory and that was Rita Muldoon. And I, I owe her so much you got to keep in touch. You got to thank those teachers, right? Like you said, you go back to grade three, grade four, it matters. It really does. And so we got to thank the teachers out there doing what we do, doing what they do. Yep. Absolutely. Thank the teachers every day. All right. A couple of quick things. How can our audience help you, Deborah? What do you need from us? I think really being supportive of young people in their pursuits and understanding that the different disciplines that schools teach, science, math, reading, writing, they're all important as young people grow and decide what pathways they want to take and be supportive and positive. I think the other thing back to sort of your point, Laura Lynn, about learning how to learn, don't be so quick to give people the answers. It's good to struggle. Students need to learn to struggle a little bit and be confident that they can get through that struggle. Um, in math, folks have taught me it's called productive struggle. It's also about growth mindset. They're all kind of connected. And so supporting young people to struggle and not feel like we always have to give them the answer is actually what ever, all, every one of us in our day-to-day -day life can do to help students and help the schools. Oh, here, here to that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all for it, right? It's like yeah. here, here, here. No, 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 no. Yeah. I, I'm, uh, not, I'm, I'm not a coddler. No. A funny story, maybe. Um, before my oldest went to kindergarten, I uh, met with the principal just to learn more about the school and, and what to expect as a parent. And I asked him and I said, so can you help me understand how your teachers help students to fail in a non-threatening way? How can they learn that they're not always successful and move past that and grow from it? And he was a bit stumped. And I would say for all of us, let's crack that nut 
and think about how we can let our young people not always get the right answer and have to move forward without that being a threatening environment, without threatening their grade, without threatening their ability to be promoted or succeed in life, but really just learn how to learn from that not getting the right answer. Oh, I love that. And that's what you know, I want to encourage our listeners to do. Be, be like Deborah. Go talk to the principals and the teachers in your schools, again, in a respectful and non-threatening way, but saying, how can we all work together as a community to provide the support that's needed so that if someone does fail, it's not the end of the world. They just learn from it and grow from it, right? I mean, that's the whole point. Yeah. All right. Last question. Bring it home for us, Deborah. We are going into your closet and we're taking a look at the shoes that you have. And you, please, are going to describe for our audience the pair of shoes, flip-flops, whatever it is, that best personifies who you are and what you stand for. And why, when you look at that pair of shoes, boots, sandals, flip-flops, stilettos, boots, whatever it is, it says, this is Dr. Deborah Jonas. Tell us why. Oh, wow. I have a pair of red slingback heels that are open toe and I can wear them in a professional environment and I can wear them to a party. And I would say that's a lot, says a lot about me. I like to sort of, I, I have a very strong professional persona, but I also can go out and play and have shoes that support both at the same time. (laughs) Oh, I love it. I would never have pegged you as an open toe red stilettos gal. You know, they're not stilettos, but they're high. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely not stilettos, you know. So again, you can, I could walk into, in the summer, I could probably walk into a Washington DC government office building in them. So not stilettos, but high heel. And then go out to happy hour that evening with friends, like in a non-professional environment in those same red shoes. Oh, that's great. It's such power and fun. And I've learned over 150 plus podcasts, I shouldn't ever, ever make assumptions I did that once, and one of the gentlemen that was on my show, and he said his favorite were custom-made high heels. Well, who knew, right? There you go. So I don't assume anything anymore, and I'm open to all kinds of answers. We've had golf shoes, hiking boots, destroyed shoes, all kinds of things. So it's a really fun question to answer. Yeah. So with that, have you had water shoes? uh, Yes, actually, we had one person who spends a lot of time on the beach. Yeah, who's coming. I don't really know if there's a pair of shoes or type of shoes that we haven't had yet in 150 questions. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. <laughs> it's my signature question. So with that, thank you very much, Dr. Deborah Jonas, SRI Director, of Education and Programs. We really appreciate you taking the time to come on to the Grit Files today to talk to us about some of the programs that you're doing and how you're really trying to drive change to make it so that all of our students learn, learn how to fail comfortably, learn how to learn and move forward to be successful and, and happy young adults as they enter their lives. All right. Thank you so much for having me. And, and importantly, that they have the skills and experiences they need to make choices when they leave high school. I love it. Everybody <laughs> needs choice. Thank you so much, Deborah. Thanks. Have a great afternoon. And how about that fantastic intro by Touch Circle?